There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to the Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She was Grizabella in the original Los Angeles Company, which is sometimes dubbed the U.S. national tour that didn't tour number two of Cats. So welcome, Kim Criswell, and thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for asking me. It sounds like a lot of fun, this thing. I am excited to have you here because you are on the earlier side of productions. I mean, this is very early. This is, I think, what you said, the second time that it was in the U.S., right? So this is like mid-80s. Um, tell me about your tour, because I usually ask my first question of what was your experience with Cats before you, you got cast, but there wasn't a lot of experience before that point. So like, how did you even hear about this? Um, interestingly, I have, a, I have a long trajectory with Cats even before I did it, although it only took place over a couple of years. Um, I had, I was a Broadway girl. I was in the original cast of Nine when it started being talked about this show. And so I sniffed around and I got myself a copy of the vinyl album of the British production. And I listened to it and I thought, well, I want to sing that song. I I could sing that song. And then I got some auditions for it. So I went in and I auditioned and I auditioned. I had four auditions. And on the fourth one, it was a Gumby Cat final. And I and I was at the end of it, the guy who was the production stage manager, who was a pal of mine, because I'd worked with him before, said, hey, listen, you're really in with a shot. At, the, at this moment, you're the first choice for that. And I went, really? Not for the Broadway, the original Broadway. Okay. And I was like, I don't want to be the Gumby Cat. So <laughs> <laughs> I went into the next audition and said, uh, listen, guys, here's the thing. Uh, I know you're going to need somebody... Uh, you're going to need a cover. Maybe I'm too young because I was in my mid-20s. I was like 24 when this was going on. Um, I said, you're going to need a, You're gonna need an understudy at the very least. And I know I'm young for this but, and everybody wants this part, but so do I. I said, uh, can I sing the song? And they said, yeah, sing the song. And I mean, the they I'm talking about were Trevor Nunn, Gillian Lynn, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Cameron McIntosh. It was the wow. A-team. You know, that's who it was. And I'm like, I don't care. I ain't scared of nobody. And so I sang it. And from then on, I was kind of up for Grizabella and the Gumby Cat. And so I went through another audition or two. And then they did their final casting. And I was not cast as either role. But I got a handwritten letter from Trevor Nunn delivered to my apartment, which was quite something because nobody did that nobody did anything like that and it was a really it was a really lovely supportive letter that said listen you weren't quite enough this or enough that for these two roles but you know i i do want to work with you in the future i think that you're a very talented person but basically it was a lot of compliments and and you know i was very disappointed but i but i was it was a very flattering and and it was it was a good letter, and it, it was really I've always thought that was a, a an incredibly gracious thing to do. Apparently, he sent not a whole lot of those letters, but a few to people who got very near but didn't quite get there. So I didn't know how close I'd gotten or what. So a year later, um, no, well then the original cast, the original Broadway cast, I had a friend in it. The original Tantamile was my friend Janet who uh, TV watchers will know her as Aunt Viv on The Fresh Prince, okay. Janet Hubert. She was my friend. She was the original Tantamile, and I went to I went as, as her opening night guest to the party. And so, you know, saw all of them again. And anyway, I was just, I, I was in the loop and didn't know it for future productions. I had no idea. So then a year later... They were kind of faffing around with me a little bit, uh, not offering me anything, but talking to me about where they might have an opening as a Grizabella. And and the National was going out. Mm-hmm. And at any rate, I was cast in a show called Baby. So I did Baby and said, no, not doing that. And then w- the next time it came up was, uh, was the L.A. company. And they had said to my agent, look, you're going to have to go to LA if you want to audition for it. We're auditioning out there. We're not going to see people in New York. 
And I said, I'm not going to L.A. to do that. <laughs> if they want me, they know where I live. <laughs> so yeah. Then they came back to New York and said, actually, we do want to see her. And there were three of us that they brought in. And I knew the other two girls. One of them had been one of the Avas in Evita and very talented, very good. And the other one was a good friend of mine from Nine. They made them go in first, those two, and sing Memory. And then they saved me for last. And then I went in by myself at the end. And the only person there was Andrew. Uh, Andrew was there with the casting director, Vinny, and with uh, Tyler Gatchell, who was the company manager. Or they were the company management company. And they were all friends of mine, except for Andrew. I didn't know him. Mm -hmm. But I went in and I said, well, I guess I know what you want to hear. And Andrew said, no, no, I'm tired of that. Don't sing that. And I went, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, sing something else. So wow. I sang tomorrow, as in, you know, the sun will come out tomorrow. And he said, okay, that's good. But now um, uh, I, want, I need you to sing something a little bit more moody, a little bit more ballady. A little, and I said, you mean like memory? <laughs> he said, no, no, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I said, Really? So I sang a song called Unusual Way from Nine, which I had a, a part that I had played. And I finished, I, I got a little bit in and then he stopped me and said, now go back and sing it as if you're at the end of your life and you're very, very sad and you're blah, blah. And, and so I went, oh, ding, ding, Grizabella sings memory. Okay. And I sang it. And at the end of it, he said, well, we want you to do it. And I went, what? <laughs> After yeah. all this time, just like that? And so that's how I was cast. It seems pretty clear that they had already decided that it was going to be me unless I really screwed it up. Yeah. So um, I was I cast. I love that they almost were challenged to like, don't sing memory. You it's like, no, no, don't sing here. that. Yeah, we want to I make like, sure. like, really? <laughs> that you is really don't need to hear me sing it? So you, so, okay, so it's, what was the time? That was a couple years from start to finish there? Like, how long was that? Yeah, like, um... The, the Broadway Cats, like nine opened in uh, May of 92, 82. Um, Cats opened in the fall. And so the auditions were that year, I think. Um, okay. So it must have been two years later when this was going on. It was like a year and a half, two years later, about. Because it, it, we started rehearsal in the fall of 84. Okay. In L.A. So, so tell me a little bit about at this point, like what is the, I've heard a lot of the fan response in this at this time frame what's the like acting in broadway community response to cats in this was this like everyone i want to be in it i need to be in it or was it a little bit of like this weird kind of show off onto the side like what was the community that's performers thinking about it well nobody knew what it was yet really because we hadn't seen it for the original i mean by mm -hmm. the time i got around to la we'd all seen it but but uh for the original one everybody wanted to be in it I mean, it was gold dust to get an audition. And so wow. I was lucky enough to get an audition in the first place. In fact, I'll tell you what I sang at my first audition because you will get the beauty of this, although they did not. <laughs> I, I was like, I'm going to pick the perfect audition song for this. I found this song called Paris is a Lonely Town, which is written by Harold Arlen, the same guy who wrote Over the Rainbow, great at ballads. You know, it's a sort of moody Paris is a Lonely Town kind of song, sort of in the same mode as memory. And I went in and sang that, and the, the clincher of it is, it was sung in an animated film by a cat character played by Judy Garland called Musette. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, this is the perfect song. So I went and sang that whole thing, and it went completely over their heads. <laughs> None of yeah. them knew anything about what that was. That but I mean, funny. obviously, they thought I sang pretty well, or else they wouldn't. It wouldn't have gone any further. But none of them got the reference. I was being too clever for only my own self. I mean, it was completely wasted. One of those, yeah. It's like if if somebody would have got it though, it would have been. I know. I would have. have I would have felt like a genius, but I didn't end up feeling like a genius. Yeah. Anyway, desired effect got a call back. That's all that mattered. Exactly. But um, yeah. So you know, a couple years later, it's L.A. I go out there. I've never been to L.A. Um, and I realize that pretty much everybody was cast in the L.A. theater community. So I was the one they brought in from out of town. The New Yorker and cast I wasn't, for Isabella, of course. Yeah, I was not famous. <laughs> I was not well known at all. So it was quite a daunting thing because, mm -hmm. you know, all those people in that company with me had auditioned to be Grizabella. Yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. like, well, well, who is this you got then? Um, 
we all bonded hugely and became a big family. But it was it was very daunting for me at the beginning because I realized that it was pretty uphill. Uh, they all, you know, they they all had they 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 wanted to. Why'd you bring this person in from New York? I mean, who is she? I love it. You know, and critics and people like that were quite, why didn't we get Betty Buckley? You know, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Well, you know, if the Schuberts had wanted Betty Buckley to do it, she would have done it. So (laughs) they obviously didn't. They wanted me, and that's the way it goes. You got it. It's very in character. You got to bring the outsider to come in to the the tribe for for Grizabella. Exactly. And it helped that I had... It helped that I had had so many friends. By then, I'd had friends in every company of it. And there were only two companies, but I had friends in both of them. And, for instance, the first day of rehearsal, my friend Kevin, who had been old Deuteronomy in the Boston company, which then became the first national tour, Mm -hmm. had said, listen, when you go to rehearsal the first day, make sure that you're wearing really nice perfume. And I said, (laughs) why? (laughs) He said, well, you're going to do this improv. Jillian is going to have you do this improv where everybody crawls around and you're going to crawl all around and you're, you're hanging back. And then you, essentially you'll, you'll all end up in one great big pile. So make sure you smell really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I was like head to toe perfume. And we did end up doing that. And we ended up in this big pile. And then, you know, when the pile broke up, somebody near me said, who is that? That smells so nice. Yeah. <laughs> I said, it's me. <laughs> I was warned. <laughs> so uh, it's just the things you do in cats. It's just craziness. <laughs> I love it. So that's the felinity school, right? And like the sexual clump. I've heard a little bit about these things is what, is what they, oh, yeah. I've heard. I, I actually like to go back to this point in, um, in the rehearsal process for you because the thing that I'm most fascinated about in this entire show is how you're explained the loose backstory of your character. And it seems, and I think you alluded to this earlier when we, before we started recording, that everyone seems to be told slightly different things about their character. Yeah, I think, you know, when we first started, the first day we were supposed to have Trevor Nunn with us, but he had been off doing this movie called Lady Jane and it had run over. And so he wasn't with us at the beginning. We had a we had a, a you know a resident director in his place, basically reconstructing what he did in the other companies, and he had sent a very very long video, where he had done, at least ten minutes on each character, and go wow. and Coricopat. Well, Coricopat has a secret. <laughs> you know, it's like that for. Two hours. Our, one of our first sessions was sitting and watching the video of Trevor talking to us and telling us about our characters. I and do I remember what exists. he said about my... I, I don't remember what he said about my character. I don't. Not, it's been 40 years. But, uh, it, you know, it, everybody in it was so jazzed because it made everybody go, oh, I, my character's important. I have a whole story. I, I mean, it's all woven all together. It took about two months for the company to realize that some people were in the chorus. <laughs> some yeah. of us were principals, yeah. and some were in the chorus. <laughs> it I, took a while for this magic spell to wear off, and they go, oh, I don't have a solo, do I? I'm in the chorus. Wow. Oh. Uh, I love it. Yeah, it's everybody's got their full part and family. It's, you know, it's, it's you got to, there is deep backstories for some of these, for all these characters. What do you remember from this? Even not just exactly what from... Grizabella, but what stood out as you were hearing two hours of Trevor Nunn? Like, what, what did you go, really? What? How? How did this come up? Like, how did you think of this? Um, I, I really can't remember what he said about my character. I just remember thinking, wow, he's gone into great detail in his head for every single character, and that's impressive. I was impressed with that. I thought that was amazing. Um, what I do remember about rehearsing it was not knowing what the words to memory were meant to actually mean because it's a series mm. of kind of vague images it's it's not they're not actable lyrics they're not you know they're not active verbs and things like it's it's not the sort of thing where you go and now i'm going to run to the wall and you know it's yeah. not any of that um it's images it's a series of images and while we were rehearsing it i felt very cut off from everybody for quite a while because we would go in and we would do a a dance warm-up every day because of course I had to be in the opening as Grizabella Mm -hmm. is always in the opening section as a generic cat who has no name but they she's named him later. They named they named that cat later. Did, it's named Baby Grizz in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Did 
They didn't name her in ours. Okay. <laughs> she was she was just generic cat with a different wig just on gen- and a yeah. unitard, which was terrifying because I don't know if you've ever put on a unitard and stood in a room full of really skinny dancers, but it is not something that's pleasant for those of us who yeah. don't look like that. There's it's a reason like, I oh, haven't man. been, uh, I have not done a, any production or, I mean, besides actual talent of being, not being able to do any of this, but no, I have not put on a cat's costume or cosplayed this because I do not need to uh, be in a unitard. Okay. Well, I didn't either, but I had to. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it wasn't something I needed to do on any kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, I needed that for myself. And also the costume, the costume fitting was one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life because you go in, at least at that point, you'd go in and you'd be in a room with John Napier and he would mm-hmm. put you in a white unitard. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> like, Victoria. Well, it, but it's just like, you know, anybody who doesn't have the most perfect dancer body in the world is horrified at the look of themselves in a white yeah. unitard. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and then he just gets a magic marker and he starts marking. That was how he created people's shadings. Wow. He would, he would color it in with a marker on your white unitard so he'd know what to do. So you, he know, just, but, you just stood there while he basically colored each cat onto yeah, he, each person. Yeah, he absolutely, that's how mine was done. And I'm sure that the others were too. Because, I mean, in, fascinating. you know, she wears that unitard under her little dress with heels for, for the rest of the show. So there's a little more coverage and a coat and all that. But for the opening bit, she's just in a unitard like everybody else and in flat shoes. So, um, you know, I was just sitting there watching him with his magic marker just... <laughs> Marking, marking shading down my legs and going, oh, let's just cover up that. I'm like, yeah, just paint it all black. Just paint it black. <laughs> crazy. Absolutely it was, crazy. It was frightening, but fun. And, of course, when we started rehearsing, um, we would go in every day. We'd do a dance warm-up. And then they'd drag me off to a room, and I would go through the bits that I do in the show, which, as you know, add up to about 15 minutes. Yeah. So I'd go through that. Trevor wasn't there yet. Jillian was in the other room. So I was in the room with the resident director. And I do remember being frustrated with that part of the process because I would ask him a question and he'd go, uh, well, that, that's because that's how Betty does it. I'd go, well, okay. <laughs> uh, I'd really like to know more about why. And he just didn't, he didn't usually have the why I was looking for. Um, so he'd go, oh, Lori does that, that, does it that way in the nas- first national. And of course, I know, I knew, Be- I didn't really know Betty, but I knew Lori. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, shouldn't I make my own choices? Um, there was one point where he was in the remark the cat section where he'd say, now listen, you know, you come in and they're, they're horrible to you. They come up and scratch you, and, but you're never angry. And I said, why am I never angry? He said, well, you're, you're just not. You're, you're never angry. And I said, what am I, Jesus? <laughs> I think I'm not. <laughs> I think she's kind of flawed, isn't she? Isn't she kind of human and flawed? Like she might get mad if somebody scratched her? Anyway, so we had a few of those things where it was very clear that he was frustrated with me and I was frustrated with him. And so I was very relieved when Trevor arrived, which was a couple of weeks before we opened because I got him and I'm the first person he took off to a room and I just said please talk me through all of this yeah. <laughs> just you know and he said well of course you can be angry I went thank you <laughs> good yeah. <laughs> yeah he didn't he didn't get in the way of my instincts and I, I could talk it through with him um, and you know it, it, that mattered to me enormously to be able to to work mm-hmm. all that stuff out but I was really just working out I wasn't working out backstory and all of that you know, to hear that other people were told that she's not old, she's not dying. Gee, I thought I was old and I was dying. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what I was playing. Yeah, there's. And, I mean, there is so many rumors of, like, how you can think about the backstory. I wonder if it's in the 10 minutes of the tape that Trevor is supposed to tell you. But there's a couple that, like... There's the question of, like, what's the relationship with McCavity? And are you the mother of Bomb and Demeter or Victoria, potentially? Or why did you leave the tribe? Like, there's a lot of these open-ended interpretations that you can kind of go into. And I think a, a point that you mentioned that's fascinating, and, and I never thought about this the first time I saw it until someone said it, but to take all of that and convey it in 15 minutes on stage is is a challenge. So Well, 
it's good to have backstory, but it doesn't actually bring the here and now to the audience. The here and now is going to totally. need to know what you're doing right now what, and why yeah. are you doing it. So that's why I was so busy with that rather than going, oh, am I the mother of this one over here? I don't think it even occurred to me to wonder about that because who had time? And there was no way to show it anyway. Yeah, and I think, well, I think it's, it happens more in the reverse than it does in Grizabella's character. Because I think if you're Victoria and you are approaching Grizabella, you can approach, is this my mother? And have that kind of thought into that approach. Whereas I think Grizabella's character comes in and has such a short period of time and sings this kind of, you know, ballad. And it's a little bit more of where you are the focal point the entire time you're on versus a lot of the other cats are in the background and on stage almost the entire time that they kind of almost need a little bit of that. What is my story well, of to course play they off do. each I other? Mean, I think all of these backstories and all these details kind of arrived on the scene in productions where they were on a bus and truck and they're getting on a bus every day yeah. and they're doing a different, you know, they're doing split weeks in two different cities and they're constantly traveling and they've been doing this show for a year and they need to keep their mind engaged. So they're coming up with more and more and more details to explain what their, you know, what their life is and, and, and how they came to be this character. Um, honestly, in the, in the L.A. production, I don't think anybody spent that much time on that because we were trying to learn the show and just get it on its feet in those six weeks. So um, I kind of love it. I, it seems like it wasn't as much brought to you as it sounds like later on it was. Like, I think in 2016, you got your 10 minutes. I think in 2016, it seems like they got a little bit more. They got three words. They got all this stuff to mm -hmm. to try to give them more of that backstory than maybe they were thinking about even in 84. Yeah, I mean, things get embroidered more and more heavily as time goes on. They just do. And this was pretty early days for this show. Uh, yeah. You know, when you when you figure there's been a London company and then there's been a Broadway company and a tour and then us and we were at the same time as the one in Sydney. So we were the we were the first five companies mm -hmm. and we were the ones we were the last two that us and uh, us and the Australian one were the last two that the original A team put together, meaning Trevor, yeah. Gillian, Andrew. Um, you know, the original uh, Stanley Lebowski, the original people. From from then on, companies got put together by assistants and by, you know, by, 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 by the next level of people overseeing the show. So we had the benefit of the original team. And the original team was learning as they went, too. Of course they were. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot of... I mean, the beauty of the show is, is it's an entire like family and scene and group is being built, which means that... that I don't think anybody probably would have ever needed to think about all the pieces that could have been the backstories, everything, because it's not relevant in a lot of cases, unless you're me or the super fans of the junkyard trying to figure out this stuff because we're recording 80 plus episodes, 90 episodes, trying to figure it out for other people. But uh -huh. to your point, you don't you don't need it in some cases. Well, and they're not carbon copies, the companies. Uh, yeah. The choreography may be the same. They try to keep it as much the same as they can. But... You may watch a road tour where Bombay Arena has decided that, you know, this kitten over here is her long lost sister. Yeah. And that didn't that's not being played at all on another company. It's just because those actors, they're playing on stage with each other all night and they're yep. filling up the space with stuff that's fun. And yeah. they're creating their own lives. But no two of them are going to be the same from company to company. The backstories are never going to be identical. I have loved that because when you look at the rumor mill a lot of it, as I've uncovered some of the rumor mill, whether it's true or false, a lot of it has stemmed from me and this other cat were friends as actors before the show, and now our characters shouldn't be friends in the show, but we are, and so we kind of play off of the fact that we are, we have a great relationship, and all of a sudden it turns a little bit of the super fans on their head because they're like, these two cats shouldn't like each other, but they clearly are having a good time, and it's purely because of a relationship as two actors. Which is exactly such there's a two levels thing. of these kinds of shows. There's two levels of stuff going on. There is the level of what you're playing and what you're supposed to be playing, and then there's a the level of people just having fun. Yeah, and there's that's how you keep a long run alive is to have fun and find ways to entertain your, each other and yourselves that don't hurt the show. Uh, ideally, although <laughs> it's not all, it's not always that pure, 
But I mean, like with ours, with the peaks and the pollicles number, which we all just rolled our eyes and went, oh, <laughs> I was so glad I didn't have to sing that because yeah. <laughs> it's a, a nightmare of words. And, you know, our poor monkey strap. I mean, he has to do deliver that and not go up on it. And our guy, Mark, was fabulous and wonderful. But every so often he would get in the wrong verse and trip on a word. And we had a couple of very naughty cats that would sit down front with their backs to the audience and hold up little tiny ratings cards that would go 7.4. That's what I mean. That's what they get up to. You know, if management caught it, they'd they'd stop them flat. But there there was always playing going on. And... In a show about cats, that's not the worst thing in the world, because cats do play. We're going to take a quick break for some messages from our sponsors, and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. That is what I wanted to ask you next, which is, what are some of the memorable stories or quotes or lines or stuff that you remember from from your group? Uh, um, my favorite moment from... Uh, from from when Trevor had gotten there, there was a moment where they were giving us notes, and of course he he went back to the beginning of this show with Jillian Lynn, mm-hmm. who was Jillian, man, she was a force of nature. I just loved her, but she was very very interesting and odd and unique. She was not like anybody else I've ever met, and she had her own way of looking at the world. And so they were sitting there talking about the opening number and, you know, all of us with our jellical cats and singing and dancing and carrying on. And she said, oh, at this point, and, and I mean, I remember Trevor's face was the priceless thing because she, she said, oh, at this point, you're all looking over here and then you hear something over there <coughs> and you go, oh, it's nothing. It's just a couple of cats having a bit of a fuckity on the roof. <laughs> then, there was, then just Trevor's face <laughs> was like, Wow. <laughs> It was kind of like, there she goes again. <laughs> it was kind of like that. Um, Unbelievable. Because, you know, she, she was capable of surprising him, too. Um, he just was like, wow, what goes on in her head? Um, other things, there was a funny audience thing that happened once that just cracked me up. Um, when I would sing Remark the Cat, of course, I would come out. And, you know, for the first time you see Grizabella and she comes out and everybody hisses at her and spits and scratches at her. And she sings a Mm -hmm. snarky little song to go, (sighs) get away from me. And then she goes out while they sing the Grizabella, the glamour cat, rest of it to explain who she is. And she goes wandering out through the audience. And I would go out through the audience and then I'd wander through the, I had to wander through the lobby and then go back around to backstage and get back to my dressing room because I didn't have to do anything for another half hour. So... (laughs) I'd go back and get on my princess phone and sit on my little pink sofa. I mean, I was so spoiled. Anyway, I'd go out and uh, usually I'd talk to the bartender out there. And so I was like, hey, how's it going? How was it? He said, listen, I have something great to ask you. I said, what is it? He said, well, last night I had a lady come up to the bar and ask me in all seriousness at the interval. She said, I don't know how to ask this, but what is a genital cat? I said, uh, we howled, and I went, oh, gonna, give them, gonna need to give them a note about the diction, I think. <laughs> and I said, well, that's what's so funny. These cats don't have any genitals, none at oh, all. It's all squashed into nothingness. We're all Ken dolls and Barbie dolls. <laughs> that is but really funny. She was hearing genital cat through that whole number. That's what she thought we were singing. I so, love that. Isn't that's that great? Too. That's yeah. That's that's one for the classic book. It is. Um, <laughs> and the other thing, um, you know, we had, um, you know, the beginning of the show. If you've seen it, have you, you have seen it? Mm-hmm. Yes, of course. I'm not sure if in the I haven't seen the the more recent revival, but so I don't know if they still did this. But one of the fun things that everybody had to do, and most of us got to a point where we're like, really, do I have to do that? Was at the beginning we'd be squashed into this little vestibule. Uh, And then they'd start playing the overture and then we would all slink around in the dark and then pop up in people's faces and flash our little green eye masks and watch the people go "Ah!" because they didn't know we were there. Uh, We called it the green eyes. And uh, one day we were all like crammed and we have to be really, really quiet. We can't say anything. So we're in there trying to make make no noise so nobody hears us. And one of the cats... I won't mention his name, but he was the Gus Growl Tiger, and he was very funny. 
he just in the silence went, I smell pussy. <laughs> so we could not be quiet from that moment because we were screaming our heads off laughing. <laughs> um, just, you know, you may need to cut that out because that's a bit vulgar, but it was funny. Uh, well, um, nothing is we cut. Just, that will it, not be just, cut. Not, that, well, it was funny. And, uh, you know, that... My memories with cats uh, of cats are laced with stories like that of all of us just playing and having fun. We had so much fun with each other, and we all we liked each other. You know, there was there was so there was great. not a squabbly cast. We didn't squabble with each other. Most everybody got along, and it was just everybody playing on the set. So I've I've heard that almost with every production I've talked to, and I've always wondered because you know I. I equate a lot of this as someone who's never done theater. I equate a lot of this to, and you can see all the stuff behind me, sports teams, where I've mm-hmm. put on teams that all got along super well, and I've put on teams that didn't get as long as well. And I think that that's the same thing in theater. Like, you have cats that all get along super well, and there's some that probably don't. But I've never heard it in cats, and I've always wondered, is it because you are forced so early on to become so close to each other that you almost kind of have to let your guard down? And is that like is that because of the way the show is created, or is it just been good fortune well it is the physicality of it the fact that you are crawling around on people sniffing each other and ending up in big piles in the rehearsal room at different times and you know the whole orgy part of the jellicle ball i mean mm-hmm. you can't be coy you yeah. can't be coy and also when you have a room full of dancers dancers are so cool about their bodies you know their, their bodies are just their tools they don't they're not they're not at all modest about any of it ever because their bodies are machines. They're just yeah. extraordinary things, dancer bodies. Um, but we did, you know, we, th- there is a choice that is made. And in, I decided that it, it was a choice that Grizabella should make early on. Because I thought, well, there are two choices they have here. They can either pretend to hate me all night and then at the end decide they love me enough to let me, you know, be chosen. Mm-hmm. Or it can be the reverse. They can hate me all night and really hate me. And in the end, pretend to love me. Mm, I like I'm going to try to be the one that makes them pretend to hate me. I, I, I want to be bonded with this cast. Some Grizabellas, I'm not going to name any names, but there have certainly been Grizabellas who kept to themselves and were kind of hated by the company. Because face it, it is a bit of a princess role. Yeah. You know, yeah. you come in. You do, you do the opening number, and that's the hardest work you do all night. Then you go and you change, and you hang around, and you come out and sing a little bit of a song. And then, you, then you're off until the, the very end of the Jellicoe Ball. And then you're mostly gone for the whole second half until you sing the big number, and you get to go to Kitty Cat Heaven and Die. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's I, w- I won't say it's an easy lead role, but it certainly is in terms of time on stage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it has its other ways that it's difficult, but... Um, quite something so i i remember you know me starting out with that company and not because they were all in rehearsal all day every day i would do my little i'd I'd do the warm-up with them and then i would do my my go off and be taken into a room to sing through my stuff and then they go okay you're done for the day and so i'd get in my little car and drive to the beverly center and shop because i didn't have anything to do (laughs) And meanwhile, they're killing themselves learning the Jellicoe Ball every day, all day. So they didn't know me. They didn't have a chance to get to know me for a while. So the first time we put the show together and did a run through, none of them had ever heard me sing the song oh, or anything. Been in a separate room. I've been doing stuff isolated. in a different room. Yeah. I remember that was the most pressure that I ever felt was that first run through with the cast. Because I realized they don't know me. They all auditioned for this. They don't know why this chick was brought out from New York instead of them. Um, yeah. So there's a lot riding on this. I've got to prove it right now. And then there's the other part of it, which is, okay, she has to have a nervous breakdown on stage in front of them. Mm-hmm. That's what that cat does to sing that during yeah. that song. That is what it is. And I know that the audience will think I'm acting, but the people on the stage with me will know that's how I cry. That's what I look like when I have a breakdown. And they will either decide to be protective of me when they see that, or they will decide to point and laugh. 
And that was the riskiest part, was realizing that if I really do, there's no faking it, for me anyway. I couldn't figure out how to fake it, so I didn't. Um, to try to to try to sing that song while you're having a nervous breakdown and really putting yourself into that state and making it that much of a of an absolute disaster breakdown, um, you know, people are watching you fall apart. I'm not a pretty crier. I'm an ugly crier. You know, they all know that now. Yeah. <laughs> they all saw it every day. Um, it that's when we bonded. Was that first run through because they decided that I could stay. Wow. You were just like the show, accepted back right in. Yeah, they decided. You know, I was I was genuinely vulnerable because I didn't know any way to be fakely vulnerable. I had to be real. And thankfully, they didn't decide to kill you after, which is the yeah, next step. Yeah, and they, that. they, they went to my level and treated me with respect and with with caring. And, and you know, it's just it's very vulnerable to it's a kind of nakedness on stage that if you ever have to do it's incredibly freeing because once you've done that and having to do i did it for a year and a half once you have figured out how you do that and then you have to figure out how you keep doing that mm -hmm. because thinking about your dead dog in third grade is not sad anymore once you've used it a few yeah. times yeah. you have to constantly be you know getting yourself to that place before you go on to sing that last song um but they, man, my company was with me. We bonded from then. That is amazing. And that's, um, that's the joy of that show, because that is the reason. I think that is the key thing that audiences catch on to, is they go, eh, okay, yes, sure, they're all cats, but she's wearing a dress and high heels, and she's, she's having problems like me. Yeah. She's showing very human traits. And being very, very vulnerable with it. Totally. I think that's what makes the show so unique is it's relatable. A cat, a cat is relatable to almost everybody. And so there's the people that are going to relate to Grisabella, and there's going to be people that are going to re relate to all the other different cats. And so that's why there's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, Absolutely. I want to switch gears and do a quick rapid fire before we talk about the, the million dollar question. Um, okay. So if you were not going to play Grisabella, for one night, if you could just be any cat, which one, which track would you wish you could have done once? And I'll say suspend male, female, like just which cat, if you could, if you could dance, if you could sing, if you could do anything, forget if you could physically do it or mentally do it or anything, just who would you want to do? I think I probably would have liked to be Griddlebone, you know, the, the woman that sings with Gus. Okay. And then turns into the opera, you know, opera yeah. singing girl, because that was a lot of fun. That was, and honestly, you know, I, I even, even in my fantasy, I cannot fantasize myself into one of the dance roles because I just know <laughs> I'm not equipped in the way I would need to be. So I will fantasize myself into one of the possible roles, which would be that one, because that one is a lot of fun. It's a good thing. And honestly, the girl who played it in our company, Sally, was my understudy. So, you know, the, Reality. the people that had the more singery roles tend yeah. to cover each other. I always I realize that I give that disclaimer because I'm talking to all these extremely talented people. It's for me. It's because I can't sing or dance or do any of these roles. So I'm giving the disclaimer as if like, all right. So if I was just blessed one day with being able to sing or dance, which one would I want to do? But um, who are your favorite and least favorite characters in the show? Um, I really like. I, I can't stand Buster for Jones. That's okay. such a waste of space. It's like, oh, please don't make me watch that. And it's not the fault of the actor. It's just like, ugh, you know, they could cut this. I wouldn't miss it. Yeah. Um, but most favorite um, characters. I do like, I like Bomb Ballerina. Everybody likes her because she's just out there. She's mm -hmm. like, I'm not. I'm not going to apologize for who I am. I'm yeah. I'm sexy. I want you to look at me. Can you see me? Here I am. I'm going to wiggle my butt in your face if you can't. Yeah. You know, she's she's right out there. I, I like that. Know. What is your favorite song from the show? Memory, of course. Yeah. Although I love the moments of happiness, too. Okay. I love it. Um, since you did perform in L.A. the entire time, which cat do you think gives off the most uh, L.A. vibes? Oh gosh. Uh, Tugger. Tugger. <laughs> Rum Tum <Okay>. Tugger. 
<laughs> I was thinking bomb. So, I, and I, but I think both of those kind of have the same yeah, kind of you know, persona. Tugger, you know, and and he was an LA guy, and he was married to a TV star, and he was just you know, he he was he was quite fabulous, but he was very LA, very LA. I love it. All right, so the million dollar question. I have argued um, that I don't think Grizabel was the right choice, and so I would love to hear your take. Do you want to defend your year and a half of being Grizabella, or do you want to say, all right, I'm going to pick somebody else to be the Jellicle choice? Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I, I'm going to defend myself, or her, okay. Grizabella, as the choice, and there's a, the reason for that. There's one thing about her that is different from everyone else, at least as I played her. Um, she's dying. She's desperate. She needs it. She doesn't want to die alone. So you don't think she will make it another year? She's got, mm -mm. she's got to go now. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, I think that during the song, you know, when she's singing Memory, you know, there's a point in the middle where she actually falls down. Mm -hmm. That's not because she's being histrionic. It's because she can't walk. Okay. So you're... She's, you're... she's, she's failing. Her body is failing, I believe. I think that's what that is. And she manages to struggle to her feet, but she needs it. Okay, I so she needs she I, needs redemption. She needs she and also, she's the she's the human choice. What do you mean? By because that? she's she is the choice that if you're going to you know live in a in a what would Jesus do kind of world, what would Jesus do? He would pick the one that really needs it. He would pick the one that needs the redemption, that needs... He would he would not pick the one that's earned it. Okay. He would pick the one that needs it. And by, by picking that one, everyone else learns compassion. So they get to learn from I, it. I... So I do like... I mean, I think that that's... The, the redemption story makes sense. I think what you said something that I've... Counters against something that I've been arguing most recently, which is I do... It, it almost bothers me that she gets let back to the tribe. She gets like re-welcomed to her family and then immediately killed off. And I and I thought like, hey, why doesn't she go next year? But your whole point is that she's not going to make it. She's got to go now. So how, what about Gus? Because I think Gus is kind of the, the same of like, not that also needs it, you know, is really getting up there. Seems like he might not make it another year. Is it, is that even somebody that's in consideration I think he I think he should be under consideration, certainly more than, you know, the Gumby Cat or you know, the Mr. Mistopheles or mm -hmm. or Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser who are pretty much kittens. Um I think it's I th I think why her over him is because she is so flawed. Mm -hmm. Because she is in need of actual compassion and is she has, and she has learned something because remember, think about this. I don't know if you've ever had a cat, but cats are not, they're not um, pack animals. They don't no. like to be in packs. Yep. They're, they're quite solitary in a way. And when they're dying, they go off by themselves to die. So for her to need to be around her kind mm. so much that she will overcome the instinct of dying alone that is you know, built in to a cat, any cat, um, she really, really, really is, is afraid of dying alone. That's what it is. And that is the thing that is the most human thing. We all have that same fear. Mm -hmm. There's no one without that fear. That is why she has to be accepted with them. She just wants to be near them. She thinks she's going to go in and see them and then she's going to die quietly in the corner, but she'll be near the warmth. I, I love talking to Grizabella's because you have such passionate answers to this and you always every Grizabella always defends Grizabella. Um what what would your take be is if you as Grizabella don't come back this year because I think the assumption a, a a pretty fair assumption is that you come in halfway through the the show almost and and through if we're ignoring the show through the decision that night who goes if you don't show back up? Uh, what? Who should be the second choice? The what first runner-up. Second up? choice. Let's pretend that you don't even like. This isn't your year. What if um, it's next year that th you have that need? I think it's probably Gus. Gus. Okay. I think Gus is the one who's 
nearest to needing it because there get, there comes a point where you know if you're an animal you're at the end of your lives mm -hmm. even if you're a cat and you're supposed to have multiple ones and you know whatever this reward is i mean it is it is sort of i mean you know the original poems there's a sort of christianity based thing there's a heaven aspect to it there mm -hmm. is it, you know it is it is kind of allied to that belief system mm -hmm. so um you know everybody everybody that is christian wants to die and go to heaven and you know that that they've sort of put that on these cats in a way yeah. that's why you even have this this is the reward yeah. you get to go off to heaven in your in your whatever whatever version of the set you're in <laughs> yeah. yeah it's true yeah. wherever wherever you're going um, yeah because ours I, was our, you know we had the tire but we ours had a a thing that was flown in that looked like a big kind of meteorite and i would it would fly across and kind of dock with the it wasn't like the broadway set it would kind of dock with the tire and then i would get in it and then it would go out at an angle so kind of diagonally and we would always go i remember when we first did the tech of it and going i going to john napier and saying well what is that is it a meatball or is it a <laughs> bathtub and he said oh i think it's something festive from vegas <laughs> <laughs> Because it's covered with lights, so yeah, that works. <laughs> that is so fun. So that's the heavy set layer is uh, uh, the upstage in Vegas. Yeah, it's the meatball that takes you there. And the and meatball. honestly, one of the worst shows I ever had was one time the tech crew didn't quite make it dock, and so it didn't get close enough to the tire for me to get on it. So I didn't get to go anywhere. <laughs> I was so just like just stuck on the, on the tire. tire. And I'm like, here I am, and here's the big finale song, and well, I'll just sing along. And I just sang along until I realized I didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Uh-oh, turn my mic off, guys. Yeah. <laughs> just wow. going, damn it, we've just ruined the whole plot. That's what yeah. there is of it. <laughs> uh -huh. That is fine. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories and defending Grizabella. How can we stay in touch? I know you, you are on Twitter. Where else can we stay in touch with you? I'm on Twitter. Uh, I have a website, uh, Kim Criswell dot. What is it? Dot. It's not dot com because somebody had that one. Um, it's one of those. We'll find. We'll <laughs> oh, find it's dot it. UK. It's dot co dot UK. We'll link if you it wanna to go everybody. Li listen to me sing things, and you can look me up on YouTube. I'm kind of all over YouTube. Um, Amazing. You know, uh, but I live in London now, so uh, you know, it's. It, I don't know how much of what I do over here gets back across the pond to the, to you people over there i think the this uh audience base is all over including i know a, a lot i talked to a couple people that listen to every episode that are in london so i know that this will reach everybody well i hope so that's nice because you know cats is forever they said now it's, and forever now and forever and it's everywhere it's still it's all over it's playing all over yeah, and then there's the movie, but that's another chapter. <laughs> different, different podcast. That's what start, that's what started this, uh, but that's a whole other whole other episode. Oh man, I knew they were in trouble with that movie when there was all this discussion about whether the cats would have CGI anuses or not. And I just thought we are in so much trouble. There's no way to salvage this if that's if that's uh, a discussion that's being had. It has been a very easy punchline. Um, I actually will say as as this is being recorded because I'm not sure when we're going to be when it's releasing. But as it's recorded, I recently started writing um, stories for the Broadway Beat, which is a satire website. And I, uh -huh. my most recent story was making fun of the Cats movie, so um, <laughs> it is there for its purpose. Uh, and I'll share that with you when when we when we have off. Oh yeah, definitely. I need to know about that. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being an amazing guest. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat's catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok on, at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, thewrongcatdied.com. Thank you.